It was an enormous house. It was fun, it was exciting. There's lots to do, lots to explore. Um, very much a classic childhood from a storybook, really. I was six then. My parents were most aware of it. It would happen quite late at night. And they asked around a bit around the village and got feedback that, yes, there were stories about the house. My sister ran away from home there and she never went back to the house. There's still nights I wake up and I think, oh gosh, I'm back at the head of the stairs again. We were sort of typical professional family living in West London, and we decided that we didn't want to bring our daughter up there, and so we, we moved down here. We were very keen to find a period house. We were fortunate enough to find one which we really wanted, fell in love with. It was what we wanted. It was big enough for the three of us, and with a view to you know, having more children. We were very happy, really, there, at any rate, to begin with. I was quite a busy little child, maybe quite a funny little child, but I loved my own time. It was more really about Susanna and her behaviour that made us realise possibly something was wrong. I was frightened of George. He was a really tall, haggardy man with dark under his eyes. She always used to wake up in the night, she started screaming. Uh, and when she was old enough to talk, she began telling us about people. Abby had a really pretty face, actually. She sort of had straggly black hair, and there was something really spiteful about her that really was scary as well, but not in the same league as George. She would talk about the man, and that the man was coming. I'd reassure her and say, no, there's no man, it's OK, there's no man coming. And one day, actually, we were in the garden together, and she said to me, Mummy, there's the little Abby. And I just shouted at my mother, there she is. There's Abby, look, why, why can't you see her? Very often, young children do have imaginary sort of friends. Um, so we didn't really think an awful lot about that at the time. I experienced weird forces in my bedroom. And I woke up in the middle of the night and I ran to the door and the door just, I couldn't get out. It wasn't there anymore. It was like a brick wall and I was trapped in my room. It was like I was being swirled around by a kind of force. I also, at that point, was having another baby, and uh, Emma was born there, and very often when I put her into her cot at night, she would look quite frightened, and her eyes would actually follow something around the room, which I couldn't see. And I don't think a baby of six months actually reacts like that, you know, unless it's something that's real. It was about midnight and I was sitting watching television and I was suddenly very aware, and I mean really aware, that somebody had walked in and sat down beside me. I really knew now something wasn't right. I have to say that my reaction to this was deeply cynical. I felt that, you know, this was just sort of fantasy. Things didn't fit. It was like just a jigsaw puzzle that just didn't fit. These sort of events can come between families. And I think that we were quite close to that, being on the brink of that. It was a difficult moment, to be quite honest. 
My father thought we were all nuts. He just thought my mother and I, would we'd gone mad. Diana was much more concerned, much more sort of warm and, and understanding about it. But I said to her, you know, it's very important from my point of view, if you want me to do something about this, that there is proof. One day I had some friends for lunch and they brought their children. There was a little boy and everyone else but him were downstairs and he was in Susanna's bedroom. We suddenly heard this awful screaming, real fear. And we raced up the stairs and we found him on his own. And when we asked him what was wrong, he said, Susanna's granny and the man with the bad leg were frightening me. They were telling me I shouldn't be here. I won't say that was sort of total corroboration, but it certainly gave me the jolt that I needed. There was almost a conspiracy of silence in the area. I think that the locals knew more than they were letting on, actually. The land around there has a very bloody history. There was a lot of black magic apparently practiced in the 17th century, and there were certainly a couple of murders. That led to us getting in touch with um, an exorcist. It's a very beautiful, very brief service involving every room in the house, a prayer which is about casting out the particular entity and saying, go to thy appointed place, and then a following up prayer which is to calm the whole thing down. It was quite extraordinary, and we all sat down and had a sort of cup of tea, and we said, what's your batting average? Oh, well, our, my batting average is about nine times out of ten. Do you feel evil? Um, usually not, but sometimes very, very much, very, very plainly. And that same night, Susanna said, Mummy, Abby's gone to heaven. And I said, well, that's great, that's wonderful, you know, that's where people are when they die. No one can understand the feelings that I can remember in a disconnected kind of way. But Marnie can remember and empathise with all of it. For me, the main staircase was an absolute nightmare to come down. The second you took a step out onto that first stair, something surrounded you and wanted to push. It was something that would look us out, it would find us. And the most terrifying aspects of that were being smothered in my bed. A smothering effect over your face, you couldn't breathe, and struggling against something that simply wasn't there. I don't think you can ever know 100% what these things are, but I know that it happened, and to be honest, I just think that it's not something you really want to dabble in. It was an amazing release, really. She was the same age as I was when I'd lived in the house. My memories of it are so strong, and Susanna's are just the same. I had to go to work really early the next morning in London. I was literally about four miles from home, and I felt this terrifying presence in my car. I was so frightened, I stopped my car. I couldn't get my mobile to work, and then I thought, no, I'm not going to let this get the better of me. And then the scratching started really, really loud. Everybody's got a fear of some sort. Mine is being afraid of the dark. I 
I just ran. I was fighting fear on fear. I never wanted to go through that again, ever. I decided to go to the pictures. The only one shown that I wanted to see was an Abbott and Costello film. They were, at that time, to me, very funny. <laughs> I was laughing. <laughs> I knew I'd laugh too much. I could still hear the film going. But then the film ended and everybody got up and went out. One of the usherettes found me. I heard the sister say, prepare for the mortuary. I thought, oh my God, you know, this is it, they think I'm dead. Panic set in really fast. I could hear everything that was going on around me. I was petrified and what I wanted to do was to reach out and touch somebody to let them know that um, I was OK. In my mind, I was doing it. To them, I was dead and that was it. I think that's the worst thing, us would be paralysed and not being able to convey anything. That is petrifying. They just lifted me from the bed onto the slab. Waking up and sitting up and seeing these other people that were there with their tags on their toes. They were dead. Oh, I shouldn't be here. This is awful, you know, to actually know that you're surrounded by dead people and you're not dead yourself. It's, it's a terrible feeling. Then the attendant came down and I sort of coughed and he looked up and I said, um, can I go back to my ward now? Well, he ran out and I never saw him again. I think it must have been a shock, you know. I went back to the ward and then about four hours later, I was sent home. I was perfectly all right. I thought I'd never want to go through this experience again. All your vital um, uh, symptoms, your pulse, your heart rate, everything, goes down to nil. And you can be pronounced dead. Doctors did say that it was narcolepsy, cataplepsy. In myself, I'm not ill, 
So um, that's why it makes you feel foolish when you come out of an attack, that you're able to sit up and carry on as you were before, with no headache, no ill feelings, or, you know, you just get up, brush yourself down and walk away. I hadn't gone fully into the cataleptic attack when I was taken to the hospital. But after a few hours, I went into a full-blown cataleptic attack. Through the entire thing, the doctors pronounced me dead. They put me on the slab was pitch black. I am scared of the dark. I was fighting to come out of the trance. I was so exhausted. I knew I was all right, but then I had to lay there to sort of come to properly so that I could really get up. I was so... So exhausted, but um, the worst part was finally the way to the door and they're not being able to get out, you know. I'm wishing somebody would die so they'd come and let me out. And that's when I realised that... Um, I'd have to live with this thing of being buried alive. I remember saying, well, how am I going to get out of here? The only way in here is to be dead. So somebody's got to die to come in to let me out, you know. It was... And then I was wishing, not maliciously, but I was wishing that somebody would die so they could come down and that way the doors would be open and I'd be able to get out. Suddenly the door was open and I remember seeing an ambulance, but I didn't stop for much else, I just ran. Mum's growing, mum's lived with it. It's a condition that she's had to live with uh, for a lifetime. I was 15 and um, just coming home and she was there on the footpath um, with a whole neighbours and the ambulance and whatever and I just ran across. Uh, at first I wasn't sure who it was, I just saw uh, the ambulance and, and then as I said when I ran, ran across I saw it was mum and they had the oxygen tank there and and um, they saw, I, I just saw, I said mum, mum what's going on, what's going on and they said oh, I'm sorry but you know, your mum's, your mum's passed away. I 
I was just sort of telling them basically that no, she's not. She's she's in a sleep. She's she's got this condition, and they're looking at me as if I'm. Mm, yeah. In my mind, she wasn't dead. She was she was alive. She was just in a sleep. All the way there, it was all. Come on, mum, wake up, wake up, mum. Come on, come on, come on. The ambulance officers are just sort of saying, sorry, but she has passed away. Try and let us do what we have to do. As far as they were concerned, I was an hysterical kid. Um, wanting his mum back. When you pass away, you are taken to the mortuary and you are put on cold storage. And until such time she was buried, or autopsies are performed. Anyway, I came to out of that one. And he said, see, I told you she wasn't dead, she's all right, you know, like this. Yeah, and they were very surprised. He was very taken back that you know, this person he just pronounced dead um, not five minutes ago had just woken up. <laughs> it scares the living daylights out of me to think that um, you could be buried alive. Um, and to know about it. They say all doctors, you know, these days, screen carefully and you can't be pronounced dead, but believe you me, you can be pronounced dead. I moved to this house when my mum died. I've always felt there was something in there watching me. Strange things just started happening in the house. I was put in contact with um, a lady, a lady psychic in London. If she hadn't been feeling that way, then she wouldn't have done it. She said to me, there's a lady here called Von. She 
she's here and she really is sorry for what she did. She wasn't herself. Um, she was messed up on drugs and alcohol and she's really sorry and she wants you to forgive her. She's sorry. My boyfriend, Eddie, didn't believe me until... That music box hadn't made a sound for years. I didn't get on with my mum, I didn't like her at all. She used to leave me tins of spaghetti to open um, and just basically left me to get on with it. She'd leave me outside the pub on the bench and just go in there for the whole day and she'd just dump me off anywhere she could. She was told off for leaving me outside on the bench by the police because I was there for, I suppose, every day for like a good month or something. And they said it wasn't really right to leave a little girl outside a pub. So um, the next day she cut all my hair off and put me in boys' clothes and left me outside there again thinking that'd be all right. She just made it so obvious she really didn't want me. Eventually I was taken in by somebody else. Eddie and me went away and my friend Jan looked after the house. The cats had all gone and the house was freezing cold. My mum started just really doing strange things, turning up in the middle of the night, banging on the window. I want my minka, I want my minka. And then getting in the bed with me and sort of sneaking off in the night and she'd be gone in the morning. She'd have me on odd occasions and holidays and this and that. Um, so she decided to have me for Christmas, God knows why. Christmas morning, I've come downstairs because my grandma was coming to get me. I was going to go to Kent to my grandma's for the day. Um, and my mum was just there in the chair like she normally was because she'd be drinking and doing whatever she did. I looked under the Christmas tree and I thought I just had a card. I didn't think I had a present. My mum's sitting there, I've just kissed her and off I've gone out the door, not really thinking anything of it because I just thought she was still drunk or drugged up like she always was. My grandma got a bit worried, I suppose, when she didn't come back to get me in the next couple of days. And she also had a, a boyfriend that was in prison and he had, she hadn't visited him over Christmas. So my grandma called the police about four days after Christmas and they broke into the flat and she had actually killed herself on Christmas Eve. She wasn't um, asleep in the chair, she was actually dead.
That was actually a, a suicide note she left me, not a Christmas card. The note actually got sent to me on my 18th birthday. The police obviously gave it to my grandma, who was to look after it until I was 18. Um, so I think it was a couple of days after my 18th birthday the note came. Um, it wasn't really a very nice note. It said, basically, don't ever have any children. Sort of, you're the worst thing that I did, really. Look what you've done to me now. When she died, I sort of... Cos I never really got on with her anyway. It was my dad that I, I got on really well with. I don't know, you sort of adapt when you're that young, and I sort of didn't really think anything of it. I blocked it out into my head and sort of just got on with my life. But when, when that note came, that was when I really sort of started hating her, really hating her. The night that we first got back, the whole house just smelled of alcohol, especially in the lounge, and like this stale perfume. Um, Jan smelt it, Eddie smelt it, and that was when I realised it must be my mum. occurred to me that it would be my mum because obviously I didn't get on with her so I didn't think she'd be trying to contact me. Okay, I can send someone called and then it all started Vaughan falling into place. The lady psychic you. said she wants you to forgive her or if you can't forgive her to try and understand why she did what she did. It really wasn't her. My mum was a wall of death rider. She'd always wanted to do it all her life. I suppose it was like a, her dream come true. And then she fell pregnant with me, which I suppose really wasn't very good timing, you know. She was sort of torn between whether to look after me or whether to ride the wall or, or what to do. She wanted to carry on with this life that she'd, she'd had of sort of travelling around and doing what she wanted, and then all of a sudden I was there. She had an awful accident. All her legs were held together with metal plates and pins. Um, and basically, she had to sell the wall and she couldn't ride it again. And I think that really was sort of the start of, of her going downhill. She started seeing another man. Then my dad died. And I think that's when my mum finally went off the rails. I now know she wasn't here to harm me. She was trying to, to say she was sorry for what she did and um, she wasn't herself and could I please forgive her? Because, I mean, obviously I'd hated her for all these years and she wanted me to forgive her. I suppose I'd only really seen it from my point of view. I hadn't bothered to look to how she might have been feeling and how really miserable and, I mean, to do something like that, you've got to be feeling just... I can't imagine. She'd lost her wall, she'd lost her husband, um, she had a little girl that didn't even really like her. I'm not surprised she didn't want to be here. Now I realise she's with me and she's helping me and I've come to terms with what happened and I can sort of put it all behind me. The 20 years of pain and hurt and hate just sort of came out of me and went. I feel sort of at peace with myself. I'm pleased that she haunts me now, I really am, you know, and I wouldn't want her to not do it.
It's just a normal small town in the mountains. There's not a whole lot of crime in the rural parts of, of Colorado. Uh, most of the type of thing that we do is uh, old traffic tickets and barroom brawls. They're very close-knit, first of all. Most of the people here are related to somebody else. Out of the town, the whole town, I probably know 80% of everybody here. It's a tough life. Uh, not a whole lot of entertainment uh, when it's snowing out. Uh, and uh, you can, uh, it's very reclusive, so you really have to want to be here. Winter lasts around here about nine months. We've got about nine, month, nine months of winter, and we've got about three months of bad weather, so we don't get much spring or summer like that. Nice days you take advantage of, go fishing or something. There's a lot of casual labor that passes through. Oh, uh, they'll come for a couple of months and then and move on. The, uh, they're, they're people that don't really want you to ask them any questions and they kinda, kinda stay to themselves. I wouldn't say they're eccentric, but some of them are kinda strange. You can go to any small town in any part of the world and you're gonna find a lot of the types that are here. They come here for a reason. They come here to get out of the big city. They come to hide. Police today are investigating the murder of a local woman whose body was found at the summit of Hoosier Pass this morning. The victim had been killed by a single gunshot and the body left in the snow with no attempt to bury it. It was uh, off the road uh, in deep snow. I mean, very, very deep snow, the type of snow that you sink in all the way down to your knees. The interesting thing about it was that the body was just laying right on top of the snow. It was like it had been, like it had fallen out of the sky. First it thought it was her husband. He was, was having an affair and everybody in town knew about it. And then we, we questioned, uh, the police questioned some of the, the known people around, but didn't have anything to go on. There were no footprints leading to or from the body. And the only mark on the body was the mark of the, the gunshot wound. She'd been shot in the back. The gun was never found. There were just these strange, narrow, deep markings in the snow. Some of the people even thought that it might be an abduction by an alien uh, uh, because of the no footprints in the snow thing. I was fishing and I was by myself and I saw a silver disc in the sky in broad daylight. And it was your typical saucer one that's been made in movies and all that, you know, but it is, it was the typical one. And I watched it for a while and then I watched it disappear. are now investigating a second murder. The body of a woman in her late 20s was found lying in snow by the roadside. 
coming just weeks after a previous murder, authorities believe the killings are connected. The last time that she was seen was the, uh, was the previous evening. She was hitchhiking on the side of the road. We kind of figured that the person who picked her up was the one that, that killed her. Everybody was upset. They, they, were, they, they thought that there was a crazy person out there. These girls were really well liked and, and there was, uh, the murders just seemed so senseless. Panic is sweeping South Park as news of a third murder reaches the community. Police are advising residents to step up their personal security as the search for the killer continues. It's real scary, you know? I mean, I won't even take my garbage out at night. We think it may be someone in the town, so it's hard to trust anyone. Everybody gathers in the bar when it starts to snow, and, and some of the tougher guys uh, were not happy with the way the law was, was handling it, so they decided to find the killer for, for themselves. They got on their horses and uh, enforced their own kind of justice uh, on some of the more unpopular loners. We had to come down pretty hard on them. I mean, you can't have, you can't have civilians taking the law into their own hands. All of the circumstances were the same. All were young women. All were shot in the back. All were found on the top of the snow. Uh, just laying there like they had been dropped from the sky on the top of the of the virgin new white snow. The one thing that we noticed was the that there was markings in the snow, and, and this compared with the with the first murder that we had found, and then the the third and the fourth one. There were these strange, deep, narrow markings in the snow, and we couldn't figure out what those were. We uh, got all sorts of forensics experts. Uh, we had special people come in from other states. Uh, uh, we, we even had, we even interviewed notorious uh, serial killers to try to get a psychological profile. We, we interviewed everybody in town who might have had a possibility of being connected, but we just came up with nothing. It's a fun thing. Uh, people uh, uh, get dressed up, and there's uh, food uh, uh, stalls and, and uh, games and, and whatnot. At first, I didn't believe it. I, I didn't believe the chief of police, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized that it was probably this fellow. I was horrified when I heard, because then I realized that my kids have been playing with the killer at the parade. He'd been working on various jobs for, oh, about a year. He stayed in the, the woods for well over a month. He really didn't uh, intermingle with any of the people. He was a loner and just kind of kept to himself. We'd never seen him, although we'd heard he had come into town and that. Oh, we were really surprised when this guy showed up at the parade dressed like that. Well, he was a clown walking on stilts. 
they were the kind of stilts that had narrow pegs uh, and they would leave deep marks. I thought the chief was crazy, but we even got a pair of stilts and compared them to the markings that we had found in the snow and they were exactly the same. He left the day of the parade. People didn't recall if he said if that he was going any place. We circulated a description. Uh, we knew his first name, but we never knew his last name. Nobody ever, ever found him. The more I thought about it, the more I looked at the evidence, I realized that it probably was the stilt walker. They're Keystone Cops if you know what I'm talking about. Uh, they really are. We have the worst cops in the whole area. The hardest thing was not actually being able to touch her. You wanted to touch her, you wanted to talk to her, but you couldn't. But every hour, every day went past, was an extra day that she was actually alive. And that was basically, I think, the main, I think the main thing was basically, if she stayed alive, then I did. I want to see something up here, up here, okay? 